Good morning everyone, and welcome back to CS3650. Today our first topic is going to be hash tables. Now a hash table is a method for implementing a data structure, or a category of data structures, and this category of data structures is called variously associative arrays, dictionaries, key value maps, probably there's some other names that different programming languages or libraries call these things. But the idea is that we want to be able to map a key to a value, and those keys and values can be of sort of generic types. A related thing to consider is an array, which is going to allow us to map an integer to some arbitrary value, with the restriction that that integer range between zero and the length of the array. So this is sort of like an extension of the idea of being able to do array indexing, except instead of having an array index be an integer that's a small number, instead we can have it be anything. So specifically, the example that I'm going to start with at least is going to be this telephone directory here. So we have a list of names of people who work at our company, and then each of them has a telephone extension. And we want to be able to, given a name, look up a telephone extension efficiently, and we're going to assume that we always know the name of the person that we're trying to look up their telephone extension, and that we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of people working for the company, not just these four, but the examples we're going to do with four. So one simple way to solve this, this key value map problem would be to simply have an association list or an association array. So we're just going to store pairs and we'll have an array. And so we'll have a pair Alice 307, Bob 302, Carol, etc. We actually end up getting this thing as the result. And so then in order to do a lookup, we have to scan through the array. If we want to look up Bob, we're going to start and check, is Alice Bob? No. Is Bob Bob? Yes. All right, so this pair, Bob302, is stored in our array. And we can, once we've found the entry into the array with the key Bob, at the first item in our pair, we can go ahead and look, find that the value is the extension 302. That's the second item in our pair. That works really nicely, actually, for small key value maps. But once we get into large key value maps, linear time for lookups, linear time for inserts, that all sounds terrible. So we'd like to go faster than that. Now, the next thing that we could do to try to store a key value map is use some sort of tree data structure. And the traditional one is to use a balanced binary tree. If we use a balanced binary tree, we can get most of our operations down to log n. That's really efficient. As computer scientists, we like log n results. We like the sort of recursive traversals we can do on binary trees. But log n is still not the fastest we could conceptually go. And implementing trees correctly ends up being sort of complicated, especially once we get into balanced binary trees, where we end up having to keep the tree balanced. So this other option, hash tables, is the thing that we're gonna look at now and ends up being the most common data structure that gets used for this, this problem. This is the common solution to the problem. So we're gonna have some, um, some variable. Um, let's call it phones, because this is our telephone directory. And this thing is going to point to a struct and in this struct, we're going to have three items. We're going to have size, capacity, and data. This may look familiar. This is basically the same struct that we have for a vector. In fact, a vector is sort of the basis for the data structure of a hash table. The trick is that this data pointer is a pointer to an array of pairs. So just like with the associated association array, we have an array of pairs. And so these pairs are going to be a key and a value. But 
rather than doing the thing that we do in an association array, where we um, where we go ahead and um, just put things in an arbitrary order, we're going to use a trick. And the trick is that we're going to have a hash function. And a hash function is some function h of k that's going to produce an int. So in this case, in this particular example, our keys are Alice, Bob, Carol, and Dave. And so maybe our hash function here is going to be uh, h of k is sterling k. Okay, so there's a function that takes a value of the type of the key, in this case it's a string, and is going to produce an integer. This is not a very good hash function. Um, funny story I could tell about how the PHP programming language is terrible, because it actually used this as its hash function for looking up the names of built-in functions in the language, and that's horrifying. It actually resulted in some functions being named differently so that we could have faster function name lookups, but that's sort of getting off topic and ragging on PHP is too easy to spend too much time on it. But in any case, not a good hash function, but a reasonable function to be an example. So let's go ahead and insert these things into the hash table. I'm gonna start off actually gonna move size and capacity so that we have size and capacity here. And we're going to start off with a size of zero and a capacity of four. So we have four slots in our table. So first we're going to insert Alice. And what we do is we're going to run our hash function on our key. So uh, sterling of Alice is five. And then this value five is what we're going to use to determine which slot in the hash table we're gonna put this into. So the capacity of our thing and therefore the size that we have allocated over our array of pairs is four. So five mod four is one. And so then Alice gets to go in here. So we're gonna end up with our key is Alice. And just to be clear, we wouldn't put the string directly in the, uh, in the array probably. Most likely we would put the string, we would have a pointer to a char here, a char pointer. So the string would be outside the table. Although we could do optimizations where we really do put the string in the table, trade-offs in design. But just for clarity, I'm gonna put the string in the table. So our key is Alice. And we're sticking that into slot one. So this is slots zero, one, two, and three of the array. And then we'll go ahead and put uh, our value of 307. That's probably just an int because that's plenty of space for our extensions into our table. Now, with just one item in the table, if we want to do a lookup, if we want to look up Alice, we can go ahead and hash Alice, get five, five mod four is one. We look in sl slot one, and now we have to do a comparison because multiple values could potentially, like multiple keys could potentially hash the same value. So we have to ask, is the key in the slot that we found equal to the key that we're looking up? In this case, we're looking up Alice, so it is. And then we can look at the corresponding value to do our lookup. So that's the, uh, that's the simple lookup operation. Let's do some more inserts here. So the next value that we're going to insert is Bob. So h of h of Bob is three mod four is three. So this goes one or sorry zero one two three. Bob goes here, 
and we stick in the value 302. Now one of the rules with hash tables is that we can't actually fill them up. If we ever fill up a hash table completely, we're going to lose our efficiencies. And the reason for that is just one of the things that we need to be able to do is quickly determine whether a value isn't in the table. So if I were to, for example, look up nat, we're going to discover that that goes in slot three. And we can immediately determine that Bob is not that Bob is not nat. So we don't find me in that slot of the table. But the way we would do a lookup, we are allowed to store two values with the same hash in the table. That runs us into one of our problems of how do we deal with collisions. But one way to deal with collisions would be to go ahead and look at the next item in the table. And in that case, you have to leave empty slots. But let's not actually do it that way. Let's go ahead and keep trying to do our insertion. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and insert Carol. So H of Carol is five, which uh, mod four is one. So Carol also wants to go into the slot. So I'm gonna, um, you know, let's, let's go ahead and do it the way where we're, where we're gonna probe forward. So what we would wanna do is we would wanna insert it into the next slot in the table, which is here because then we can do lookups by comparing, uh, comparing Alice to Carol, but we don't want to fill up the whole table. So instead of actually doing our insertion here, what we're first going to do is we're going to uh, allocate a new larger table so that we don't fill up our table too much. In fact, we don't want to have a load factor in this style over 0.5. So our strategy on collisions is that we're going to do probing. In this case, there's a couple different ways you can do probing. In this case, we're going to do linear probing, where the idea is if we hit a collision, we're just going to move on to the next slot. If that's full, we move on to the next slot. We'll keep going until we find an empty slot. For lookups, we go ahead and look up the slot. We see if it matches and we keep going until we find an empty slot. So for insertions, we insert in the first empty slot. For lookups, the first time we hit an empty slot, that tells us there wasn't a match. But with this probing strategy, max load is 0 0.5. So we don't want the table to be any more full. Like we don't want size to ever get to be more than half of capacity. So the situation where our size is two and our capacity is four, that's as full as we ever want the table to be. So to insert Carol, the first thing that we need to do is we're gonna go ahead and grow the table. Um, so let me move this over here, probing max load 0.5. To grow the table, what we're going to do is we are going to double the size of the table, just like for a vector. So we're going to go ahead and uh, go to eight slots. That's going to increase our capacity to eight. But then some of our insertions might not be correct anymore. If we and so we have to go through the whole table and ask, all right, if we hash Alice, is that still still one? Or is uh, 5 mod 8 no longer 1? 5 mod 8 is 5. So Alice actually goes in slot 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 down here. And we would allocate a new, a new array, just like with a vector, and we would copy the values over. But here I'm just going to move stuff because there's only one thing to move. We're going to move Alice down to slot 5 where she's supposed to go. Bob, we do 3 mod 8. We still get 3, so Bob doesn't have to move. And now that we've grown our, our table, 
we can go ahead and do this insertion of Carol. So Carol goes in the Alice slot, but she doesn't fit there, so we'll probe forward one. Carol is extension 116. Size is three, capacity is eight. That's less than half. So we can go ahead and insert Dave. Dave, hash of Dave is four. Four mod eight is four. So Dave goes in one, two, three, uh, sorry, zero, one, two, three, four. Dave goes here. So that's the mechanic of insertions into a hash table. Now if we want to look up Alice, we hash it, find out that it's here, and then start scanning forward and if we find Alice, Alice is the first one. If we want to look up, uh, I don't know, what's another five, five letter name? Um, Franco, with a K. No, Frank is a five-letter name. If we want to look up Frank, hash of Frank is five, five mod eight is five. We look in slot five, that's not Frank. We look in slot six, because we're probing forward one at a time, that's not Frank. We probe forward again, that's not Frank, and it's empty, so we can return a lookup failure. Frank does, is not a key that appears in this table. Now, in order to produce a good hash function, we want to have something that appears random, which is going to tend to minimize the number of collisions. String length is bad at this. Aside from that, as long as we're minimizing collisions, that's really all we're trying to accomplish with the hash function. The other thing we want a hash function here to do is be fast. That makes this different from another thing that's called a hash function, which is a cryptographic hash function. That's not true. That makes this the same as a cryptographic hash function in that we want it to be ha fast. It makes it different from a cryptographic password hashing function, which wants to be slow. But it's different from a cryptographic hash function in that it doesn't need to be secure. For this, we just want it to be fast, and we want it to avoid collisions on the actual data that we're dealing with. There is a security issue here, where if your hash function is um, publicly known and completely predictable, and some attacker can insert a large number of things into your hash table, they can produce a ton of collisions, and that could potentially be an denial of service attack on your software that you're building. And for that reason, a lot of hash functions that are built into standard libraries of programming languages, including random number that's generated when your program starts, can make it so that where things go isn't predictable to, to your users. But that's not stuff that we really have to worry about right now. Okay, so this is an example with linear probing. And linear probing is the thing that you're going to be building in the homework. There is one sort of annoying complication here, and that is the delete operation. If we want to delete Alice, so we look up Alice by hashing, we find her, and then we delete her. If we just remove her from the table, then future lookups for Carol are gonna fail, because we look up Carol, try to look where Alice was, it's empty, and so we get back the result that there's nothing there. The sort of standard way to solve this problem is that we can move Carol back one. So Carol could move back one, and we'd have to recursively keep doing that, or loop and keep doing that until uh, everybody who matched Alice's hash is moved up, even if some of them are like past other things that have different hashes, which is kind of a mess. So moving things back is the best solution, probably, but it's not necessarily the easy solution, the other option that we have is that we can put in a tombstone here to just indicate that this is a deleted item. And what constitutes a tombstone is an interesting question. We'd have to have some value that is different from empty, but is different from any valid value. So we could put some like, if these are strings, which are sort of char pointers, we can make it so that the empty slots are zero but we can make our tombstone value be like one, just the pointer value one, because that's never a valid memory address, but it's different from zero. 
but yeah, we could put in a tombstone and then that's going to change the logic for uh, lookups. The logic now is a tombstone never matches, but it also doesn't indicate that we should stop scanning. And that leaves us with the question of, well, what if this fills up with tombstones? How do tombstones count, count towards size for calculating load factor? Those are interesting puzzles um, that you'll have to figure out to some extent if you decide to use that method. So that is, that is that method. Let me go ahead and show the other method that I want to talk about, which is what I'm going to do in the code example in a second. So we're going to delete our table. We are going to go back to zeros here. Uh, sorry, we're going to go back to zero and four here. We are going to get rid of all this stuff. We're gonna get rid of this stuff. We're gonna use the same basic data structure. We're gonna use the same hash function. We're gonna use the same data. We're just going to have a slightly different structure for our hash table. So instead of having an array of, pairs, we're gonna have a, an array of lists of pairs. When I say list, I actually mean a linked list because that's the easy way to build this. So to start off with, these are all empty lists. And the way we're gonna represent this is that in C, these are gonna be, this is an array of pointer to a, uh, a pair structure. And if we have a zero value or a null pointer, that means it's an empty list. So we have an array of four empty lists. So when we go to insert Alice, uh, the hash of Alice is five, five mod four is one. So we're gonna insert Alice into slot one here. We're gonna add a pair here, Alice uh, 307. And then we're gonna add another field here that's a next pointer. So this is a like, pair and list cell structure at the same time. Just to save us some allocations compared to actually having a linked list of pair where we'd have to have more pointers in here. So we'll insert Bob. Bob goes in slot three. Bob is 302. There's an empty list. Then we'll go ahead and insert Carol. Now, two things are worth noting here. The first one is that for this strategy, this strategy is called chaining. We can get away with a higher max load than we can get with probing because it's okay if we have uh, a more full table because we aren't probing forward to detect if we've come to the end of the group of things that hashed the same value. Once we get something that's going to hash to a value, we're gonna traverse a list. So when we go to insert Carol here, Carol was 116. We just insert her and then we end up in this state. And now if we want to do a lookup of Frank, Frank hashes to five, mod four is one. Alice is not Frank, so it's not that one. Carol is not Frank. List ends, there's no Frank. So we don't have to worry about, uh, we don't have to worry about performance problems quite as soon. We can go to a higher max load. When we go to insert Dave, he just goes in his slot. 816 and an empty list. And at this point, we have a full table. So the next insert, we'd have to do the same thing that we do for a uh, probing hash table. We'd allocate a new table of size eight, copy these values over, but insert them into the new table, and then we're minimizing our load factor. You actually can realistically go a little higher than one, but uh, 0 0.5 for a, a linear probing hash table and one for a chaining hash table is a reasonable like set of rules of thumb for what your maximum 
load factor should be. This, of course, makes delete a little bit easier. We can just go ahead and do a deletion from the linked list. That's fine. Uh, yeah, that's most of our operations. So this raises the question, why would we want to do this? And the answer is, all of our operations are expected amortized big O of one. So if we do a sequence of operations and the keys haven't been specifically selected to give us our worst case behavior, then if we want to do N insertions plus N deletions plus N lookups, it's going to take us a total of N time. I say it is expected because this depends on not having 100% collisions. If we have 100% collisions in either case, it's going to turn into linear. Here with chaining, it's because it turns into a linked list and it's just a, an association list. With probing, it turns into a big single uh, array of pairs, so it's an association array. But as long as we have sort of random-ish keys, and our hash function manages to spread it out a little bit across the table, we're going to have expected big O of one time. Similarly, the reason I say it's amortized big O of one is because we have to do these resizes. And the same logic as the vector, the resizes sort of get paid for by the inserts. But again, an insert may still take linear time because we have to do a copy. All right, another, a couple optimizations that are worth talking about. To do modulo, so if we want to do, in this case, we have a table of size four. If we want to do five mod four, we could do this with the idiv instruction, because that'll give us the modulo result in uh, RDX. Similarly, we could do it with the percent operator in C, which is the same as the modulo uh, same as the IDIV instructions taking the modulo result. The problem is this is one of the few instructions that's actually kind of slow. Division takes multiple clock cycles on most machines. Hash tables are performance critical, so it's worth trying to do a little bit better than this. And the way that we can do a little bit better than this is with bit twiddling. So the idea is we can, instead of doing a, uh, instead of doing modulo, we can do a, yeah, I can't draw an ampersand. We can do bitwise and, which in C is the ampersand operator. And if we take five, Uh, phi, sorry. So we're going to take h of x bitwise and size minus one. And if the size of the table is a power of two, then this will calculate the same modulo as the percent operator, except it will do it in less than one clock cycle instead of more than one clock cycle. We may talk later about how processors can do things in less than one clock cycle and or addition or bitwise not, bitwise operations and simple arithmetic other than division are things that we can frequently calculate more than one per clock cycle. Another thing that's important to do is pick a good hash function. That's something that's worth Googling, although I'll give an example hash function in the code that we'll write in a minute. And then the other thing that's worth doing is trying to pack things closer together in memory by avoiding pointers. That's an advantage to the probing strategy. Here we always have at least one pointer to traverse to get to the first item in the list. Whereas with the probing strategy, we can pack things all into an array of sort of fixed size fields. That's tricky if we have strings in C because strings in C tend to have pointers to them, but you can go to like heroic optimization effort to even try to pack that away. And that's potentially worth doing because again, hash tables are performance critical and cache misses are bad 
traversing pointers tends to result in. Sorry, I cut off. Of the simple schemes, linear probing is probably the fastest one. All right, I'll be back in a little while with more on uh, how to build one of these in code.